Okay, so uh, again, yeah, thank you for inviting me to talk today. Um, yeah, so this is called 3D GIS Road Ahead Part 2. Um, part 2 because there was kind of a part 1, um, obviously. But um, yeah, so what happened was yeah, back in uh, 2016, I applied for an e science grant for Dutch e science centre, and I was unsuccessful. So I got the application and I presented it at CAA and I published it and it'll be out in this proceedings. So this time I applied for a Dutch national grant and also didn't get it. So I'm back here again presenting to you today. Um, you got to see how these things go. Yeah, so back in 2016 I really talked about technological solutions. 3D spatial queries and really the general infrastructure of what a 3D GIS could look like. Today I'm going to move much more into thinking about space, 3D theory, uh, free, and 3D space, and then also some applications, hurdles, and possibly some solutions. So when we're looking at 3D space, we kind of should be thinking spatially. Um, this is a concept which James uh, Gibson, the famous psychologist, uh, kind of came up with in 1970, well, before 1979, but um, was published then, in the ec ecological approach to visual perception. As part of this, there were three main concepts, really concepts of space, processes of reasoning, and tools of representation. And. Uh, Conveniently, um, Derue has put these together and ex extracted, ex expanded from this and said that these kind of concepts of space in terms of archaeological data is about archaeological data being integrated, related and structured into a whole, so bringing everything together. And that first point is something I'd like, like you just to bookmark in your mind because I'll come back to that. Then we've got the tools of representation. This is how you store data, how it's analysed, comprehended, and communicated. In terms of process of reasoning, this is much more how you can manipulate the data, how you can interpret it, and understand this, and then explain it further. Okay. So, last year, um, I think in January, uh, Gary Locke and John Powson, who I think he's just snuck out, um, published a very good paper in Journal of Archaeological Science called Spatial Thinking in Archaeology and asking is GIS the answer? Now as a GIS specialist I really welcome this question and it really made me think maybe I shouldn't be using GIS as a GIS specialist. Come back to that. Um, because really just because we use GIS does not mean that we are actually thinking about space. This might sound counterintuitive, but having all our data in a spatial environment, we're still thinking about data, but maybe not in a way of how do people move in this space, how do we interact and understand the space we're looking at. We're so used to the space around us that we take it for granted. How people interact with that space is something maybe we don't think enough about. Um, something along these lines which they also talk about is this old idea of point and click mentalities or the push button solutions and this I think this was the oldest quote I can find I'm sure there's this goes back a bit further that Ken Kwame said in 1999 about if we make push buttons available to people which is arguments for and against um, maybe they're not actually engaging with what the tool is doing and they're taking things for granted. And I know there's two sides to that argument and I agree with both. So that's, uh, I'll, I'll sit on the fence on that one. Um, but in a kind of a broader perspective, what then as an archaeologist are we doing when we deal with digital data? Are we just a service to the broader discipline? Are we for technicians? Are we for people who make the databases, work with the GISs, make the pretty maps, end up as the last author on an article because we've contributed by making the data tidy for the more theoretically um, orientated scholars? Or is, our, is uh, 
digital archaeology itself a way of rethinking the archaeology, rethinking the space, re-representing our data and trying to engage with it. And this is what Sir Jamie Huggett has said a few years ago. I think you obviously know that I'd fall into this latter. Um, with this kind of idea, there has been some move, move forward. And this is work by Stuart Eve, where he's taken you know, a landscape, he's taken um, a settlement reconstruction, he's put it through augmented reality, and he's been in this environment. Now, within this environment, he then applies a theory of phenomenology. So he has a theoretical construct, and he has the virtual reconstruction, the two combined together. If we look at some other projects which have been more data orientated, so this is the mapping of Via Appia project, which is a point cloud viewer for, view, for presenting 3D data. There's been much more about looking at it, but the theoretical concept seems to slide to one side. So I'm, I'm being a bit mean by highlighting just this one case, but it's something that maybe for the theory tends to fall out from what we're doing occasionally. Okay. So then moving back to this idea of do we need a 3D GIS? At the moment, there's a whole wide range of diversity in terms of applications. If we want to do augmented reality, virtual reality, we go to Unity and we export it onto our smartphone. If we want something on the web, we go to WebGL. We've got various engines, there's building infrastructure modeling and a whole lot of other tools. This isn't a direction I'm going in. I want to, again, bring something back to the whole. So if we're going to do that, how can we build an infrastructure which brings everything together? Well, we deal with points, lines and polygons. That's how we model space. But if we want to go into 3D, into 3D we've got to start thinking about polyhedrals, so 3D vectors. For raster data, we, well, we have raster data as well. And for this, we use voxels if we want to go into 3D. So that's kind of how we model our data. But how do we store this? Well, it's data. Let's use a database. It's not just data, it's spatial data. Let's use a spatial database. But we also want to try to ask questions. So we want to be able to 3D query this data. Once we can get it into this kind of infrastructure, then we can make it accessible to online WebGL, online GIS. We can consider doing conversions to archival formats. And we can still connect through our conventional GIS systems. So how can we start thinking about making this a reality? Uh, this is a figure that, again, will be published shortly. And these are several pieces of software. I'm sure you'll at least know of at least one of these pieces. But they, they can work together, they can interconnect. And so depending on what your research question and what you want to do, you can approach a system like this in many, from many different angles. From the spatial database itself at the center, from the GIS, from statistics, various other things. So that was kind of theory. Now this is for some new stuff that I actually, well, actually thought, let's give this a go. So I got the QGIS, I made two squares. I extruded one into three dimensions and the other one, and these are screenshots from the actual uh, viewer. I asked the database to make an intersection between the two cubes and find the difference, and then take the volume. And so they see we now have some volumes there. Um, I then also asked it to take the difference between these two cubes, and again the volumes change. And just to prove the point, I then can do a geographical translation. So this is all in geographic space. An issue with um, uh, 3D modeling programs is that they do not model in geographic space. And so we can develop some kind of workflow. So these are, this is just a geometry. This is just showing the principle of what's possible. So problem solved. We can do stuff. We can query stuff. We can cut volumes up do stuff like that. But then we come to archaeology. This is where it gets, gets tricky. Um, so there's a site in Turkey called Kamachi that I'm working on, 
and they take point clouds of every layer. It's a single context excavation. Every layer gets using photogrammetry, and we um, get point clouds. So you could use a laser scanner, doesn't matter. Um, and you can, we know we can look at this and we can see for layers. We, can, we know that there's volume data there, but we just see, but it's modeled by point clouds. If we ask a computer to say what is contained in here, or what, if, what point is contained within this point cloud, it can't answer, because it just sees, sees some unstructured points. Um, what we want to do is take these and turn them into actual volumes, like here, and start modeling our data in, in volumetric means and thinking about the data in such a way. Um, this wasn't so easy, because the tools, as far as I'm aware, do not exist to do such a calculation. I looked at the LiDAR tools, because that's the tools that uh, you use for point clouds. So I contacted um, someone in America who works uh, with various companies, and he was very um, kind to develop a tool um, which, in which we take a point cloud A, point cloud B, and we take the difference between the two. So we have a top and we have a bottom, like I said in one of the earlier presentations. And what we come out with is a kind of bounding point cloud. So again, it's not 3D space, but a point cloud is bound, bounding what should be a volumetric entity. And this is a result of doing this on two layers. So we still have some problems with, by the boundaries, and this area was excavated as well. So there's still a bit of cleaning up to do there. But you can see there's a nice defined collection of points in the center. If we look from a different angle, you can start to see that Yes, this now for point cloud is bounding a 3D space. Um, okay, if we go back to what Drew said then about these lists of things we've got to do um, to be able to understand our space, um, you see that they're still pretty much greyed out. So we've got, so far, I've got the data storage sorted out, but we still need to work on various other points, or so I need to. Any, well, yeah, okay. Um, whoever wants to. Um, okay, so once, say we could get over these hurdles, say we could get forward, what are for future applications? Well, obviously, we could go back to view sheds. That's something that's had a lot of coverage in 2D GIS. Let's move into a volumetric world in that sense. Look at maybe the atmosphere as well, not just the subject that we're looking at. Um, we can go back to things like embodied GIS, or which, which have continued to be talked about. We can bring in other data models, um, raster data from geophysics. This is now being mod modelled through voxel data as volumes. Now Im imagine trying to take, doing a geophysical survey in 3D, doing the excavation, and then bringing the geophysics, volumetric geophysics into the same space as a vector model of the excavation, having your expected results and your observed results, putting them together and just seeing how they correlate, seeing how, if they're off by a, say, five metres, um, but it's uniform across the area, we can shift the geophysics by five metres, see how we could try to use this as some kind of feedback from the, the actual excavation back into the data from the geophysics. It's just some, <coughs> some ideas and I'm sure there's a whole host of other ideas out there as well. So I'm sure you were all there at the AGM. So I'm going to repeat this, but I'm sure you know it. Um, to try to move things forward in kind of 3D GIS and specifically 3D spatial analysis, I'm trying to, with, with others here, set up a CAA, CAA special interest group to get people to come together so we can kind of look at all the various avenues, because I've presented one, but there's an awful lot of avenues in 3D going on at the moment. Come together, have a chat, try to self-critique and analyze different methods, different avenues, and see where maybe the most potential could be found for various different questions. Um, and then on that, I don't know how the time was going, but um, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. And, uh,